Assalamu alaikum everyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam wa la ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in amma abad. All praise belongs to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and blessings and salutations on the noblest of prophets and messengers, our leader Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and on his family and on his companions. It is an immense pleasure uh, to be with you here in this community. Jazakumul khair to the organizers, to Isna Canada, to Sidi Fozan, and to the amazing, amazing staff and volunteers that we just met earlier today and have been with throughout the day and then finally to all of you for all of you coming you know mashallah in the midst of a snowstorm which I guess is on par for Toronto um, you know uh, in the midst of this on a Friday night you know to spend time in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your brothers and sisters I just want to say thank you so much for making time for this I want to hear from Ustaz Aisha so I'm going to keep my remarks brief and if you've been here since Juma, you've heard me way too many times already all right so I'm going to just sort of make one big sort of idea that I'm going to put out there you know on the table and then I'd love to hear from Musad Aisha, and I think we're going to have time for Q&A conversation, inshallah, as well. You know, sort of the running theme that I've been trying to talk about throughout the day here has, when you look at us, the story of Ashab al-Kaf, the, the youth of the, of the sleepers of the cave, is, you know, uh, this idea of suhbah, of good companionship, and what the, the power, right, the transformative power, and the, I would say the redeeming power of good companionship, that we come from many different places in our spiritual lives, and I work on a college campus, I've been there for, you know, over a dozen years going on to, I'm finishing year 16 now, and, you know, I say spiritual lives and intellectual lives, that we're living in, in unique moments in history right now. We don't have time to get into it. I don't want to belabor the point. You know what I'm talking about. We're looking at just a very tumultuous, a very broken, a very traumatized and traumatizing world that's going on in front of our eyes, right? That we're seeing it live streamed. We're seeing it on our TikTok. We're seeing it on our IG every day. And what the way that affects young people is what the big, sort of the, the one thing I want to put forward right now is what we want to create, inshallah, in our spaces, from my perspective, is this idea of belonging. Right? We have, mashallah, so many Muslims. We have so many people interested in Islam. We just saw Sister Veronica, I think is her name. Mashallah, may Allah reward you. May Allah ta'ala accept. May Allah ta'ala make you one of the leaders of this community. Ameen, inshallah. And may Allah accept all our Ustaz Aisha's du'as uh, for her. Is that this is what people desperately want. They want to belong. They're looking for welcoming, inclusive hearts and spaces. And that's my impression just from spending this day with you here that the masjid has been doing this work, is trying to do this work. And the thing I want to leave you with is that we can't just leave it on the imam or the board or the volunteers. This has to be a collective effort. We're, we have to have all hands on deck as, as, you know, as they say. Like every one of us has to be invested in what do I bring to the community? What can I contribute to the community? How can I help make this space a little bit wider, a little bit more open, a little bit more welcoming, so that more and more people feel that they belong? My reading from what I learned from my teachers when they taught us the seerah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is this is what he did regularly with his companions is that he, he trained them, he pulled out their competencies, their unique talents, he empowered them, he like motivated them, so that they became one of the most, if not the most transformative force in human history. Right? You and I are all benefiting from the mujahada, from the struggle, from the sacrifice, from the sleepless nights, from everything that our forefathers and foremothers gave. Right? The companions, the sahaba and sahabiyat. And we don't have time to go into all those details. What I mean to say is this idea now, you are of a generation right now, that so many people are at the, they're at the doorstep. They're looking for stuff because the world is broken. People are lonely. People are disconnected. People have been traumatized. People have been left. People have been abandoned. People, by any number of things. And so let us be the safe haven. Let us be the harbor where people can come into and find the sense of Sakina. Right? So what that means is that I understand we all come from our own perspectives and backgrounds. Right? Everyone has their manhaj. Everyone has, I come from this place and that place. That's fine. The beauty, the actual, like intellectually honest beauty of our deen is our deen and our Muslim civilizations, not singular, plural. We're always broad enough to accept, to incorporate, to engage with difference. Right? I mean, we have broad, broad theological boundaries. Yeah. Right of what like what is in the deen and what's outside of the deen. Our mistake is if we have the paucity of our imagination, right, to not be able to imagine and understand and study our own history because that's being dis dis intellectually dishonest or it's just being cheap, right? To not recognize the breadth and the depth. 
that our dean has, right, in terms of welcoming people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, that's the one idea I want to put out there. We can talk about this further during Q&A, but with that, inshallah, I'm going to pass the, pass the mic to Saad Aisha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to first just congratulate you. I want to congratulate you on subhanAllah, like there is, we know that anytime there is a gathering where people have come together for no other purpose except they wish to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they've gathered for that sake. There are literally angels that are searching the heavens, right? And as they're searching, subhanAllah, and they find that gathering, like there's something special, something unique. When they find that gathering, they invite all the other angels, right, to that gathering. And they come, hurry up, come to what you've been searching for. Like, I found it. I found that spot. I found that place. I found that group of people. And I want to tell you, a little bit more about that group of people because I found that group of people and so they come and they envelop that gathering with their wings and they make dua subhanallah for the people who are in that gathering and none of them leave that gathering except all of their sins are forgiven all right, and they literally brag about those servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until it reaches Allah. Like they're bragging to Allah about those servants, right? And it's literally the conversation between the malaika and the angels. It, it's, a, it's a reminder. It's an answer to there was a time when, when Allah told the angels, I'm going to create a khalifa on the earth. Right? And the angels responded like, Ya Allah, are you going to create someone who's going to do mischief and they're going to spread blood? And they're like literally listing all of these horrible things. And so subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them what? What did Allah say? I know what well, you know not. Right? Don't worry, you don't have to raise your hand. You're not in school. <laughs> right? And it's not, it's not Juma, so you can talk to me. <laughs> right? So it's Allah says, I know what you know not. Right? And so in this moment when the angels, literally what they're doing is they're like, Allah was telling the truth. Right? Like they're basically saying like, this is, a, this is the proof. You are the proof. Right? Of Allah Azza wa Jal. Like that his word is haq. That his word is, is absolutely truth. Right? So then he asked the angels. He's like, what were they doing? Ya Rabbi, they were making dhikr of you. Right? I found them saying, subhanAllah, walhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Right? And then Allah says, mm-hmm. Like, and then what were they asking for? Right? What are they asking for? Said, Ya Allah, they're asking for Jannah. Right? They said, mm-hmm. And what, did, and what are they seeking refuge? What is it that they're, they want to stay away from? They said, Ya Rabbi, they're asking to be saved from nar. I'm sure tonight you said, Allahumma hajunim in nar. Right? They said, Ya Rabbi, they're asking for protection from hellfire. Subhanallah. Allah, and first Allah says, when they're asking for Jannah, Allah asked them, did they see it? I said, La, Ya Allah. Well, Lord, they didn't see it. Right? They didn't see it. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to teach the malaika something. Right? Like they're the ones who believe in the unseen. Right? They knew that my word is true. They believed that my word is true and they acted upon that word. Right? They're the people of iman. Right? So then Allah says, okay, well, they're seeking refuge from hellfire. Did they see it? Yeah, Allah, no, they didn't see it. Subhanallah. What would it be had they seen it? Well, as it comes for the Jannah, had they seen it, they would have been more fervent in their begging and their asking. And had they witnessed the hellfire, they would have cried out more, begging to be saved from it. Allah says, then be my witness. Right? Because Allah is saying that you believed in him right? and you didn't see it. So Allah says, because you believed your amal and you, you acted upon it, and because you're trusting in his word, subhanAllah, Allah says, then be my witness that I have forgiven them and I have answered their du'as. SubhanAllah, bihamdi, subhanAllah, azim. So the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, also, he told his companions that when you hear about these gatherings or you pass by the gardens of paradise, stop and graze in them. So the companions of the Prophet them said, gardens of paradise, what are the gardens of paradise? Ya Rasulullah, like we're in dunya. What are the gardens of paradise that we're going to find? He said, there are the gatherings, the places where my name is being mentioned, where people are making dhikr of me. And he says, stop in that gathering. So in both of these narrations, right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, not only do they not believe that all of their sins are forgiven, even if someone came, Right? They had no intention of, of attending the gathering. Right? They, they came, they dropped you off. Right? They're like, okay, I'll see you later. 
right? Or they came to deliver food, or maybe they came just to, you know, for some, they had some need. So they came for some need. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels, even they are forgiven. I said, why? Because that's the beauty, that's the power, that's the barakah of such gatherings. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al -adhim. So that's how I want to say that Allah has placed you in the gathering. You answered the call. So I'm congratulating you. Said subhanallah that you, that you answered the call, right? You came to this garden of paradise. You are a part of that majlis. You are a part of what the malaika subhanallah are searching for. And bi idni rabbi, you won't leave here except that your sins are forgiven. Mabruk. Mabruk. Then Allah Ta'ala, right, he tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on top of that more, right, another one. Allah says on the day, of the, uh, there's a, on the day when there is no shade, there will be no shade except for my shade for seven groups of people, right? And most of you, SubhanAllah, are already in two or three of these categories. One of them is the youth, he spends their, the, the one who spends their youth in the worship of Allah. And I see many young bright faces, MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Many young Aishas, radiallahu ta'ala, and many young Musa bin Umairs, many young Khalid bin Walids. I see them, subhanAllah, and you, young, young Maryams and Fatimas, Allah Mubarak, right? Youth who spent their time in the worship of Allah, those whose hearts are attached to the masjid. Why did you come here on a Friday night, right? In the middle of the night on a Friday night, Wallahi Ladim, you, you could have chosen to be somewhere else. But the fact that you chose and said, Hey, on this night <laughs> of Ramadan, when Barakah is descending and people are being saved from hellfire, their sins are being forgiven, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is freeing people from hellfire, I'm going to the masjid. Allahu Akbar. So that is a proof. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that's a proof, right? That on Yom Qiyamah, He will grant you His shade. And then there's some of you, you came as groups. I'm coming with my friends, right? I'm coming with my girls, I'm coming with my sisters. Right? It said, those who come together and they depart for no other purpose except they love, they love each other for Allah's sake. They came and departed only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's something, there's another secret inside of this. The ones who love each other for, each other, for Allah's sake. Because subhanAllah, to love each other for Allah's sake. As Sheikh Omar mentioned, this suhba. Right? Not only is it something that, you know, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu they strengthened each other, they encouraged each other, they made, you know, they even when moments when they would feel afraid or they would feel fear or they would feel tired, that good suhbah, right, would literally strengthen them, it strengthened their heart, it strengthened their stance. Right? That hold together to the rope of Allah and do not be divided. But also, subhanAllah, what does it mean deeper than that? Because when you love each someone, it's not just like we're acquaintances, we know each other, we're cool. No, it means that we've been patient with each other. We've been through some stuff. It means that we've seen some hardship together. It means that there's a moment where you had to forgive me or I had to forgive you, but I didn't abandon you because you're my brother or you're my sister in Islam. There's a moment where either I disappointed you or you disappointed me. SubhanAllah. But you are my brother and you're my sister in Islam and I love you anyway. I love you more than your mistakes. And I hope you love me more than my mistakes. Right? Because the, the light of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in our hearts is brighter than our, than our misgivings, than our misunderstandings, than our wrongdoing. Subhanallah. This is the meaning of Allahu Akbar, that Allah is greater than our transgressions. That his forgiveness, subhanAllah, is greater, is greater than our mistakes and our sayyiyat. Allah says that he has allowed his mercy to outstrip his wrath. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina wa habibina wa maulana Muhammad wa na'anihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So I want to say that, subhanAllah, if all evidence is, is adding up, I it just I'm just I'm just looking at the evidence, right? I'm looking at the, the what's stacking up in your favor. It's it's very clear to me that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set a track of Jannah for you. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying you are the people that He wants to give you His shade. But I also want to tell you something else. And the reason why I congratulate you is we all know the difficulty that we're seeing, subhanAllah, all over the news on our phones. So every single place. Every place, subhanAllah, we find that 
in China with our Uyghur, um, Uyghur Muslims, our brothers and sisters there, whether it's in Yemen, or may Allah bless Yemen for their courage, subhanAllah, or in Syria, or in Afghanistan, or those who are still suffering from the, the ramifications of what happened in Iraq, our brothers and sisters in Sudan, and Somalia, and the Congo, our brothers and sisters in Chicago, literally all over the world, right? For everything that we see, just like the companions were chosen for their time, you are chosen for this time. I don't know what it is about your hearts. I don't know what it is about your courage, about your steadfastness. But Allah knows something about you you may not know about yourself. Because Allah says, لا يكلف الله النفس لا وسعها. That he doesn't give you a burden that you can't bear. So Allah has chosen you for this time. He said, you are the generation of that kind of resilience that you can stand firm in it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you are the group of people who have the kind of hearts who can stand it. And subhanAllah, there are two aspects to this particular ayah. When Allah says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Meaning that you are those people, that's one. But the other thing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm going to make you those people. I'm going to give you the strength. I'm going to give you the iman. That what happens is that when the companions of the Prophet ﷺ endured some of the things that they endured, literally the love of dunya begin to fall out of their heart. And the love for the akhirah begin to fill their hearts. So as you're seeing some of the horrible things, horrible things of this dunya, it teaches you, subhanAllah, this dunya is not a place for permanent residence. And if, if what I'm seeing, if these people are the people who are going to hell, God forbid I'd be with them. Let me be from the, let me be from the people of Jannah, but because I I definitely don't want to be identified with these, some of these groups of people. I want to be identified with the people of light, right? The people of Khair. I want to be with them. I'll leave you with this. When Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, "Wakuntum azwajin talata, wa ashabun maymana tima ashabun maymana, wa ashabun mashama tima ashabun mashama." وَالسَّابِكُونَ السَّابِكُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ الْمَقْرَبُونَ فِي جَنَّةِ النَّعِيمِ طُولَةٌ مِّنَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنَ الْآخِرِينَ right. The majority of them are from the past, right? They've already gone by. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He mentions that there are moments, الواق, this is in Surah Al-Waqiyah, there are moments of calamity. There are moments that shake us, that shake us up. But in those moments that shake us up, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divides people into three categories. The people of the left hand, and what are those people, subhanAllah? What is their ending? And they're the people of the right hand who receive their book in their right hand, and they feel happy, subhanAllah. But then they're also the sabiqun, those who are foremost in faith. Those are the ones who are outstripping everybody else. Now what's so beautiful about it is that we would look at it and say, well, that's the companions of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those are the anbiya, the awliya. But Allah says, subhanAllah, we know that there are no prophets at this, at this inn. You have a chance to be from amongst them. That Allah Azza wa Jal has granted you the opportunity, the chance to grab, to say, I want to be in that category. Not just Allah's shade is, subhanAllah, we have this subhanAllah, Allah's shade is great. But what is the reward of the sabiqoon? Right? They're the ones that are near and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are a guaranteed success, subhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you to be from amongst them. For surely he's chosen you for this time. And we don't question his wisdom. We know that his word is true. Jazakum Allah al khair. Afwan minkum. Allah mubarak. I guess we're going to answer some Q&A now, inshallah. Um, yes, so we do have an online link submission. So you can go to isnacanada.com slash inspiration to submit your questions. Um, does anyone from the audience have a question to get started? Any questions? Yep. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, this is kind of a tough question because I'm not really sure how to word it. Um, I have a really close friend, and she is Christian. Um, and during the month of Ramadan, um, I've been talking to her a lot about Islam, and she's 
very, very interested, alhamdulillah. Um, however, she she's also um, like devout in her religion to the point where she's um, like a lot of things in Islam makes a lot of sense to her. Because mm -hmm. she'd ask me a question like, oh, what happened to this in your Quran? I'm like, OK, so this happened. And I get so <laughs> excited and she's so excited to hear it. Um, but she also uses her um, her experiences in Christianity mm -hmm. and how, quote unquote, Jesus has saved her from so many things in her life. Mm -hmm. And to that, like, she asks me, like, what do you think of that? Like, is that, is, should you discredit my experiences? Or, like, yeah. I'm, I'm really stumped on how to answer any questions in that aspect. So if you could shed any light, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, bismillah. So I used to be a Christian. And then and I was someone that was raised in a very devout household. Um, like, we were that family who went to church every Sunday, Wednesday night Bible study. We were that family. Sometimes we even had Bible study in our home. And subhanAllah, uh, the thing is, is that one thing about Muslims is that we don't have the ownership over truth, right? That Allah mawjood, that Allah is present. And so for those who are sincere, Allah blesses them. The difference is in having conversation. First of all, the first thing you want to do for her is make dua for her, right? Because Allah maqalim al qulub, right? Allah is the one who changes hearts, subhanAllah. And the fact that she already believes in God, She's closer than, than most people know that. The issue is having, we, when you say, you know, you can just tell her, honestly, when she says, do you negate my experience? It's like, no, Allah is with you. But I do want to just say to you, in Islam, right, that in Islam, we believe that even that Jesus, he, he prostrated in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's good that you use the Bible for her, right? That Jesus prostrated in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know that Jesus prayed. And so for us as Muslims, we believe in the God of Jesus, right? And you can just tell her, and even in that case, that it's in, for us, if we look at God the Almighty, the everlasting, who could never be persecuted and who, who could never die, because he said he's almighty, right? He said he's everlasting, so there's no chance if he's almighty that someone could harm him or that shaitan could test him, right? So in him being almighty and everlasting, for, just keep it like that. For us as Muslims, <laughs> right? We believe that we, we worship the God that Jesus worshiped. Right? And we believe that Jesus was, you know, he is the Messiah. We talk about that he is, that he is the Messiah, that he was born of a virgin birth. We talk about him, but, but when it comes to God the Almighty, we pray, to the, we pray to the God that Jesus prayed to. Those who just be in the Rabbi, inshallah, they may help. But mostly, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-hadi bi-idni rabbi, who will guide her, bi-idni rabbi. May Allah open her heart. But those were some things that when I was in that process, right, that I was like, when people would, when those moments came to, you know, those moments of like, hmm, there's a moment in, in the Bible where Jesus is praying. And it's like, who is he talking to? Right? <laughs> so, inshallah, may Allah intervene. Allah musta'an. Thank you, Saza. Um, once again, the link to submit questions is isnaicanada.com slash inspiration. Um, the link is working. I know it's a tricky word, but inspiration. Um, there is a question that we have here. Uh, what is the best way to structure your dua? Hmm. <laughs> um, so the first one, uh, this is actually what I wanted to talk about tonight, so I'm really happy. Um, the best way to structure your dua is the first thing is you're going to start with the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Right? You're going to start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You're going to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like how Fatiha starts, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So we praise Allah before we ask for anything. So the Bismillah, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Send salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then after Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, O la ilaha illallah. Then we say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam. Like, sin salawat on the Prophet. Make istighfar. Right? Ask for Allah's forgiveness. Show gratitude to Allah. This is like the, the you know, you have, uh, in, I love burgers. I'm American. Okay? So, in, you, you know how you have like the basic cheeseburger? Right? You got the basic cheeseburger. You got the bread. You got the meat and the cheese. And that's it. Right? It's not as good. 
It's like when the burger has, I'm just, I'm telling you, I'm American, so you just got to forgive me for this, right? It's not as great as like when that burger, yes, lettuce and tomato, yes, and pickles, and, but not just any onions. It's got to be fried onions. And if you add like some beef bacon with that and another level of beef patty, that's the burger right there, right? The one with the, and then if you put some mushrooms and some, some barbecue sauce, la ilaha in the law. So my point is, is that you could make a basic dua. You could just be like, oh Allah, ya, ya Rabbi. But I, if I'm gonna, like this is Ramadan, right? This is that chance, that opportunity. So you want that, you want that meaty, you want that high and mighty, right? You want that dua that you're like, I know, inshallah, bi idni Rabbi, I got all the fixings. Make sense? All the fixings. So you're gonna make, say the Bismillah. You're gonna give praises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're going to send salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You're going to make istighfar. You're going to admit your wrongdoings. And then you're going to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessings. Why? Because Allah says if you, if you thank him, he will increase you. <laughs> right? Now you're going to put all what you want to ask for. Right? Now you're going to say, now, now it's time. Right? To ask for what it is, what your, your heart's desire. Now the door is open to you. Subhanallah. So now, subhanallah, that's your... your um, that's your second beef patty, right? First beef patty is the first one. The next one is like, you know, you're going to put your all your requests. Then before you end, you're going to do close out with the next. So that next portion you're going to close out. You're going to close with sending salawat on the Prophet. Remember, it's at the beginning, right? So you're going to close with salawat on the Prophet. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sallam. sallam. Subhana rabbika rabban ezata ma yisifun. So then you're going to, so remember how you did praise of Allah salawat on the Prophet? Now we're doing salawat on the Prophet, praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And then that's how, you, that's how you're going to end it. You're going to end it with salawat and then hamd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Got it? Now, secret sauce. Secret sauce. Secret sauce, Angel Jibra'il taught the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this secret sauce. The secret sauce is, so after you do the bismillah rahman rahim alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam ala sayyidina habibina mawlana muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam ya awalin awalin. يا آخر آخرين يا ذكوة النتين يا راح من مساكين يا أرحم الراحمين right يا أول أولين the first of the first يا آخر آخرين then you are the last of the last يا ذكوة النتين oh oh the owner of majesty and and like you solve every problem right like you are the one who puts all things in order يا ذكوة النتين um يا أرحم الراح يا راح all the one who shows mercy to the one who's destitute, right? To the one who is impoverished and destitute. Then you, the one, you are the most merciful of those who show mercy, right? So the first of the first, the last of the last, the owner of power and majesty and the one who can solve all problems, the one who is merciful to the destitute and the most merciful of those who show mercy. Right? You put that in there, you got that dua mustajab sauce right there. Insha'Allah bi idni rabbi. Insha'Allah bi idni rabbi. Now, you want to add some, you want to, you like, I need, for me, I like the stack it. You know, I want to make sure. So we, we add the hadith, right? So there's another hadith that says, if you ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something and you say, ya arham rahimin three times, Right, so then when I get to Ya Arham Rahimin, say it three times. <laughs> right, Ya Arham Rahimin, Ya Arham Rahimin. Now, the great thing is you're coming to the Masjid Allah in Ramadan. So, if you make dua at the after the Adhan, between the Adhan and the Aqama, your dua is accepted. The dua that said, Subhanallah, and when you're about to break your fast. So, I know a lot of people, as soon as the Adhan goes off, they're like, Oh my goodness, Bismillah. I'm like, Wait, Habibi. Like, you got the chance, <laughs> right, for something great right here. You got a combo, right? You got the, you got the combo. You got the adhan between the adhan and the akama, and you're breaking your fast. So whoever recites the adhan, right, and then you make dua before you break your fast, you got that window of, like, you know what I mean? Like, great window. So you want to do it at that time. Then you break your fast. SubhanAllah. So that's what, that's, you know. You want, to, you, it's, you want to do it by your words as well as by the time, right? Allah has given you 
great times for dua. So the one who's, uh, you know, who knows the best times, that's also khair, inshallah. And of course, the last third of the night. Beautiful. Thank you, Saza. We Thank have a back. question on the sister side. She might be a little bit biased because she's over here. I know that. <laughs> but we're coming to you, I promise. We're ending that. No, they raise your hand. It's not like it was Why did you sit down um, You know, mashallah, everything you're talking about tonight, like it's really hit me. I'm getting a little bit emotional. Um, and, you know, I've been seeing your women program all week. So connecting back to kind of what you talked about yesterday and having the wakko in those really hard moments. Like we all know we're all living in a really hard time and like keeping that connection, that role to Allah, as you said, is like so critical. And I guess like my question is, how do you overcome the humanness of yourself, the fear and the anxiety that you have mm -hmm. in trying to like hold on to that rope and having the wakko? Like, you know, it's like, of course I want to continue with my ibadah, but it's just not feeling the same because I've just got so much stress and anxiety about what's going on in my life, about what's going on in the world. So mm -hmm. how do you kind of get past that to be like, no, I have to stay steadfast and, and be focused? Mm -hmm. The first thing is to give all your, I think there's something that, um, we have to give ourselves permission to do. We have to give ourselves permission to fall apart. We don't, I know in our minds, we're trying to keep it all together, you know, keep it all wrapped up looking neat, but it's okay to fall apart in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, to just say, yeah, Allah, I have so much fear, I have so much anxiety, I am so worried, right? I think sometimes, we're making ibadah while trying to carry the load, right? So we're trying to carry the load of our fears, our worries, our concerns, as opposed to, Ya Rabbi, I'm giving you all this. <laughs> like, I, I can't carry this load. It's okay to fall apart in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't come to him put together. He prefers when we come to him, like, I'm admitting that I'm broken. One of my favorite narrations is... Musa says, Ya Allah, where can I find you? And Allah tells Musa, you can find me with those whose hearts are broken for my sake. Like those who are saying, Ya Rabbi, I'm, I, I want to worship you more, but I don't, I'm tired. Ya Rabbi, I want, to, I want to be more engaged. I need your help. Ya Rabbi, I want to pray to you. Please get, help me. Give, me. give me a strength from your strength. Bring me to your ibadah. Hey, depend on Allah for everything. Tawakkul on Allah is not something after. It's in everything, every single thing. My Rabbi, I don't have the strength. I need you. I need you. I need you. Please, please come to my rescue. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Saza. No um, we have a question submitted for Imam Bajwa. Uh, I've heard a lot of people speak about the incredible community at Yale. What have been the key elements of building a gone conscious community. Assalamu alaikum, bismillah. Jazakum al-khair. I came to hear you, I just want to say. Like, I just want to keep the questions coming and listening to Ustaz's uh, answers. Uh, thank you so much to whoever asked that question. You know, um, whatever we have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, you know, one of my teachers would make a dua, and then I'll answer your question. They would say, Ya Allah, use us, don't replace us. Right? Like, the best, one of the best things that we can make dua for is, Ya Allah, use us for the service of your deen, for the khidmah of your deen. To me, that was the mindset, the heart set of the companions, the Ahlul Bayt. They woke up every day being like, what is Allah going to do with us today? Right? Um, and so I, I hope this, like, the reason I mention that is that it's a dua that I try to remind myself every day is that I want to be worthy of Allah to use me for the ser service of deen and to, to beautify the deen and, uh, in whatever way he deems fit and not to replace me because that means I just... You know, I'm, uh, I, you, you want to make the cut, right? You, it's self-talk. A lot of what you talked about is also self-talk. Mm -hmm. There's a self-talk of when I'm low, and there's also a self-talk of when I want to build myself up as well, right? I just say, I just want to mention that, is that it's what you do, like, when you look up, you know, ideally when you get up for Fajr, like, you look in the mirror, is that, uh, how do I get through today? But to answer the question, I honestly don't know, subhanAllah. I mean, uh, and I'm saying that just like, I started there 16 years ago. Uh, it, it was, uh, Allah opened Duhiz al Fatah. You know, we have this beautiful reminder of uh, recalling upon Asma al-Husna. He's al-Fatah. Allah in his infinite wisdom brought me there. And uh, I have to say this. It's always the, you know, the, the, I'm the public face. It's always the family behind the scenes that is really pushing us. My wife is more than half of the operation uh, with, uh, you know, behind the, in, like really 
encouraging me, inspiring me, teaching me, guiding me, etc. You know, and then I have to say my male positionality is that you know too often we're on stage, we get the credit, and it's people behind the scenes that don't get the credit, uh, which is unfortunate in our community. But to, the final thing I'll say about the question is that um, you know what I try to model is you know we talked about inclusivity and this idea of belonging is that how do I create a space, how do I nurture a space, so how do I curate and cultivate a space that anyone who identifies in some way of being Muslim, I want them to feel that they can walk through that door. I don't want to be the cause for ever being like, no, no, no. You, you, you want to come here? No, I don't, this isn't for you. That just to me just is so problematic at so many levels. I want to be the person that wants to try to hold the door open and says, you want to be Muslim, you're a cultural Muslim, you're Muslim adjacent, you're liberal, whatever you want to call it, right, is that like, ahlan wa sahlan. We were talking to the staff earlier today. I mean, that's how I was trained. That's what I taught my, my sheikhs and sheikhahs. That's what they saw. They modeled it. They inspired it. They instilled it. And if nothing else, we're just trying to carry on the legacy of those who, who have trusted us enough to give us of their time, right? Um, so maybe that's part of what, you know, the community at Yale is, is that people just feel that they can come. And I think the heart of maybe what's at the question is, you know, too often places people feel judged. Do I really belong there? Am I the right kind of Muslim? Am I dressed the right way? Do I know the lingo? Do I know the certain rituals and the actions and whatnot? And for so many people, even if they can't articulate it, deep down, consciously or subconsciously, that is what the anxiety is coming from, right? That's what's really kind of holding them back. And my job is to remove that friction as best as I can, inshallah. Um, to build on that, we have handfuls of questions that are all in the notes of not being able to move past sins committed, not feeling fully immersed in a Muslim community, feeling guilty about struggling with hijab, all these different struggles that young Muslims have. And um, so if you can continue to speak on how do young Canadian Muslims here now cope with that? Um, um, uh, I mean, where to even begin with that? But I think what I would say is, is that I understand where they're, where they're coming from. What I mean, when I say what I understand what's coming from, is we have to, like, you know, my brother, Sidi Abdurrahman, who is my, you know, my dear lifelong brother and, and friend, colleague, and inspirer and interlocutor, we have these conversations is that, like, we have to have really honest, critical conversations about religious trajectories and religious conversations, right? And genealogies, even. How do we get to the places that we're at now? Right, like there has to be, it's not just all personal, it's that there are unhealthy community conversations that shame people, right? That put people in spaces, mental spaces, emotional spaces, spiritual spaces of shame, of anxiety, of never feeling adequate, of never feeling good enough, of not being allowed to have any vulnerability, of just being like, this isn't for me, the masjid's not for me, this halakha is not for me, uncles, uncles and aunties are always criticizing me, all of these things. And then on top of that, like you're, you're digging deep, you're trying to be like, I want to be Muslim, I love Allah, I want to love Allah more, I want to love my deen more. And then on top of that, I'm living in, a, in, a, in an incredibly Islamophobic society, right? That's like judging me from a different angle. And so all of this is like, I mean, it's incredibly overwhelming. To, to get to the heart of the questions, that series, what I would say is, like our, our teacher just said, you know, the beautiful dua, what do we say three times? Ya Arham Rahimin. Just remind yourself of the Rahmah of Allah. He's Arham Rahimin, the most merciful of those who show mercy, right? Imam Majid, who I had the blessing to study a little bit with, Imam Majid, you know, is one of our friends, one of our teachers, one I of our colleagues. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. <laughs> Imam Majid, you know, he said this one thing once in a retreat, uh, and he said that, you know, what is your, what is your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names? And then he said, and it just hit me a certain way. You know, he says, Allah has 99 beautiful names. There's J Jamali and the Jalali. And if, and of the Jalali, there's some ones that are super Jalali, right? If I may say, right? And he says is that if your relationship, like in the spiritual heart space, is that it always go, not to take any away from the majesty of Allah's names, but if it's always thinking about Allah as Al-Muntakim, the one who's going to avenge and punish Right? And that is where psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, you're just caught up in that space. That's doing such a disservice at so many levels. Because what about the 99, 98 other names of Allah that you're not thinking about? Al Latif, Al Wahab, Al Rahman, Al Rahim, Al Ghafoor. And the list goes on and on. And so maybe we just need sort of a pivot and to say, how can I connect my heart? 
you know, to think of the mercy, the majesty, the rahmah, the love, right? That we're, so many of us are in so in such desperate need of love and validation and affirmation. Who better is there to give you that in the entire universe, so to speak, than Allah? Right? So it takes a shift and it takes work. I mean, I wish it was as easy to just say, like, do this and it's going to happen. It takes work. Part of that is surrounding yourself with the right people. Surrounding yourself with people that nurture you, people that inspire you, people that push us to be our best selves. I think these are some of the maybe elements that are there. Wonderful. Thank you. And for the sake of time, we'll take two last questions. We can take them from the brother's side. Yes. <laughs> I was just feeling bad for my brothers. That's all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, so my first question is for Ustad Aisha, and then the second question is for Ustad Omar. Uh, so the first question is, Ustad, you quoted this particular ayah that's very, you know, it's, it's very profound, uh, that Allah does not burden a people beyond their capacities. And so one of the things I've always wondered is how that applies to people who are struggling with, with severe mental illness, mm -hmm. um, and not to take this in a very dark direction, but people who actually end up giving up. How, how does that apply there? Um, and and is that a, a burdening more than their capacities? Mm -hmm. And the second question, Ustad Omar, is so you've been at Yale for 16 years, correct? And and so I'm I'm curious, how have you seen the progression of the Muslim community on campus? Uh, because there's this idea nowadays that uh, that we're witnessing a, a full-fledged revival uh, of the of, of the Muslim youth, mm -hmm. and I feel like sometimes you know we get trapped in our own circles, and and that's all we see. But I want to see if that corresponds to reality. So when it comes to the matter of mental illness, when the, the amazing, beautiful thing is the pin is lifted for them. That they're actually, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not holding them accountable in moments of mental illness. Right? So that's one of the biggest ways is that, subhanAllah, like this, when all of us, subhanAllah, our deeds are being written, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, literally, I'm not holding you accountable. Subhanallah, bihamdi, subhanallah, bihamdi. So that's the, the ultimate way that Allah azza wa is not giving them, uh, you know, that he's not giving them a burden that they cannot bear. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that there are avenues by which that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. Like, for example, the, the mind can become sick just like the body can become sick. And just like there are certain healing avenues for the body, there are also aspects of, of healing, medicine on multiple levels. I can't get into all of them now, but there's also opportunity for healing even in matters of, of mental illness, right? Whether that be through you know therapy or behavioral cognitive therapy, medication, there are a number of things. And then there are cases, subhanAllah, when mental illness is like to the point that it's something that there's, they're not getting the help, right? Just the same as someone get sick, right? And they feel like, like I'm, I'm, I'm in this state. But in the case of mental illness, that pen is lifted for them, mm. right? So that's the biggest way that they're not held accountable. <laughs> Thank you so much for your question, brother. I mean, the, briefly, I would say is, um, I love the way you framed it. The, the, the question is that, you know, we have to be aware of our own sort of cognitive bias, right? Our confirmation bias of like, oh, I'm only seeing all the good stuff that I want to see, et cetera. That's really, re that's intellectually honest. I mean, my experience over 16 years is I would say, by and large, over the sort of a longitudinal sort of perspective, I, I would concur with that we're seeing a revival. I think there's many, this is a longer conversation, there's many factors in play, but just, you know, people vote with their feet, as they say, mm. right? People vote with their feet. The numbers of people that are showing up at, not in my events, at events across campuses is astonishing. I mean, Masha, this is Allah's deen. Allah's gonna take care of it, Allah's in control, right? We see, we're witnessing what's going on. We were literally talking about this over Jai with the volunteers after Tarawi, right? Is that like, you know, we literally, mashallah, had Sister Veronica take her shahada here. Like every day, somewhere on TikTok, on IG, we're hearing about more and more people taking their shahada, people looking at the faith of the Ghazans and like being moved, being moved like existentially, spiritually, right? To the point that they're just like, what is it about these people? I don't understand what it is, but whatever they have, I need. I want that. We're talking about a time of existential anomi. We're talking about a civilization, about a, a country that like just is rootless. Everyone, we have epidemics of loneliness, of disconnection, of, of, of rooted, rootlessness, right? So when a lot of people, Muslims and even now non-Muslims, they're looking, what are people in search for? Search of, I, I alluded to this in the beginning of the comments, people want community. They want connection. 
they want to say, I belong to something, right? And this is Allah's deen, this is the, the ummah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we're honored to be as part of that. That Allah Ta'ala, is, this is in His most beautiful, infinitely majestic way is reviving it, right? That's what I'm seeing uh, for, from my perspective. The other thing that I'll just sort of make a comment on is um, I was having a conversation last night over Iftar is that some people may be uh, seeing this, especially if it's on TikTok. There's all these non-Muslims now that are like trying out fasting in Ramadan, right? Are people seeing this? Yes. I mean, it's amazing, right? I don't want to be triumphalist about it, right? I mean, this is, uh, like Allah does what He wants with who He wants, how He wants, etc. But you have to step back and you're like, subhanAllah, what's going on? I think one perspective, it's not the perspective, one perspective is people appreciate ritual. That's what so many people want. Ritual is a connection to other, to something deeper than yourself, mm-hmm. right? We've gone through a time where it's sort of DIY, figure it out, do whatever, wander, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's people on their own journeys at their own levels and paces and all that. But what a lot of Muslims, right? That the revival you talk about is, this is, I mean, Allah and His infinite wisdom gave us certain modalities, what I call spiritual technologies of prayer, of dhikr of salah, individually and in jama'ah, right? These things are tapping into deep parts of our, of our hearts, of our souls. And I think that's what you're finding. A lot of young people are like, I appreciate ritual. I appreciate structure. I appreciate mm-hmm. accountability can be a scary word for people. And I'm not even talking accountability vis-a-vis a community. Accountability to myself, like what do I stand for? What am I committed to? I think a lot of these things is what we're, we're seeing going on. So long, long story short, I am seeing a revival. And, my, and you know, we say, mashallah, if Allah uses us as we ride that wave, it's a blessing for us. So one final question. Um, I did want to remind everyone, we do have a feedback survey that we would love for you to fill out. So if you visit islancanada.com slash youth feedback, um, that way we can make these nights even better for you all, inshallah. Um, we'll end with this final question that was submitted, and we get this question every night by multiple people. And it's the age old, there's so many sources out there, there's so many different teachers, there's so much things being taught on social media. So how do we find the right sources, the right teachers, um, and the right avenues to learn from? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, I mean, great question, and it's also telling that you're, thank you for sharing that, that you're seeing this regularly. It also taps into a vein, right, that people are, mashallah, they're, th- they're hungry, right? They're really curious about this, which is actually a really good data point for me as well. Um, you know, what I would say is, mashallah, indeed, there's, you're living in a blessed time. You're living in a time of, like, you know, just accessibility, Right, that like in our time when we were young, like YouTube hadn't been invented, right? I mean, you had to, it was a different era. We won't even go down that route. I'll give you just two sort of takeaways. Is number one, this is kind of a litmus test. You know, look. F- number one, the first thing is, ideally speaking, the nature and the power of this deen is its transfer from heart to heart. Mm-hmm. This is the secret of the suhba, right? That the Prophet had mm-hmm. with his blessed family and his companions. And then they carried it on to the next generation and to the next generation, gener- next generation. That is the power of heart-to-heart connection. Finding a teacher, finding a mentor, whatever it is that you want to call it. That will be the most, the deepest, the most transformative, and the most lasting impression, right? And education that you have is by finding someone that you trust, that you build a relationship with. You invest in them and they invest in you. That is really going to sediment into your heart. That's the first thing that I would say is, find that, seek that out. You know, it'll take a little bit of time, but if you invest in that and you make dua, Ya Allah, you are al-hadi. Guide me to the right person for me. Right? Like we were just talking today, I've been rereading the tafsir of Surah Al-Kaf for my talk. And this is the third of the four stories in Surah Al-Kaf, right? Of Sayyidina Musa and Khidr alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam is the, one of the greatest nabis of Allah of all time. And even, obviously Allah Ta'ala knows Musa alayhi salam's maqam. And yet Allah Ta'ala sends him, Musa alayhi salam, a teacher. This Khidr alayhi salam. Mm-hmm. Right? To say you, had the, you need that companionship. You need that polish. You need someone that's going to extend, take you further kind of thing. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing that I would say is a little more abstract, which is that when you seek out content online, you seek out, there's websites, there's blogs, there's podcasts, there's et cetera, et cetera. It's a balance between two things. It's a balance. I want you to find wholesome, nurturing content. Mm-hmm. Content that is actually going to be nutritious, spiritually nutritious for you. What do I mean by that? What's the opposite? There's a lot of spiritual junk food on, in, on the internet. There's a lot of useless, pointless, dangerous podcasts and YouTube 
you know, series of people that are debating, take down, whatever culture, this is poison. For all the people listening out there, if your time is spent, I don't want to name it right now, right? But you know what I'm talking about. Like, if you are spending time listening to, like, people who don't have legit qualifications, they don't have talim, and they don't have tarbiyah. They don't have deep Islamic grounded knowledge, and they don't have an ethical, like, consciousness. That's what tarbiyah is. Run as far away from that content as you can because it's literally junk food that you're putting in, right? Junk in and junk out. So it has to be nurturing, wholesome content, right? That's to me would be the litmus test of, you know, and obviously you want a little, it's going to push you, right? We just don't want like, you know, say I'm here, I just don't want to get stuff that constantly affirms that like, yeah, stay here. You know, knowledge has to make you grow. You have to like literally stretch yourself to grow, right? So find content that does that for you. I wanted to add just a small point to that as it relates to being online. There are, that it should, when we're seeking Elm, it should have the three components, meaning that it's something that increases my iman, that caught, and that whatever I'm being taught is it's going to cause me to want to do more in my body, to increase my ibadah, to do more khidmah. That, and the next part is that my soul is being nourished. So a lot of times we're getting a lot of uh, information that feels very intellectual, right? And so because it feels very academic, but yet our soul feels dry, right? Our ruh feels like I'm not, I'm not being fed. So the way that you also, one of the te telltale signs that you know that this is, that this is a, what we call from the neck up and there's no heart in it, there's no ruh in it, is that especially when it's it, like the most obvious and blatant is when it's always criticizing other people. When it's always criticizing other people or other groups, you know, that's one of the, the biggest signs to, to, run, to run away from this, right? Is that you don't need to necessarily criticize other groups or other teachers or, you know, making, making takfir upon people. That in and of, that's, that's like stay away from that like the plague because it is a plague. Um, so that's one aspect. Another one is something, of course, when he talks, when Sheikh Omar mentioned about that it has, um, that it, it, it has proof. You can, you're, you're able to see, subhanAllah, like growth in yourself based upon sound knowledge, meaning there's being proof that's being presented in certain cases. But more importantly, you feel engaged in mind, body, and soul, right? And it's, there's a difference uh, between I'm feeling emotional Right? Because you can feel emotional. You can feel, you know, excited about something or get, yeah, it's like got your emotions going. But you're not, you don't find yourself, it doesn't call you to anything. It's not, it's not calling you to an, a self-accountability. It doesn't call you to check yourself. When it's the kind of emotionality that's like this one and that one and, you know, just to, especially external, that's one of the biggest signs that this is, an emotional teaching, not a spiritual one. Right? And so that one, it's, it's very, very, uh, very, very key that all knowledge, even the aqli knowledge, fiqhi knowledge, meaning knowledge that's for the mind and knowledge for the soul, is all about strengthening the ruh, which is about our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So if it strengthens my nafs or, you know, it that's not going to help, <laughs> right? That you need to, like if I can just quote, you know, verse and chapter and I can debate with you, that's not going to help. What's going to save my soul in the akhirah? How is it? And when your soul is moved, your body will follow. So that's, that's one of the things in terms of finding that teacher. Um, and there's, you know, this, I just want to highlight if I can, from this sister's question and something Sheikh Omar mentioned about there, there has to be that balance between I feel I'm, I'm in my yearning for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in my excitement and joy and recognizing Allah's rahmah. And, you know, there's some like this, right? Like there's a, and we live in an age and time of this where 
like there's knowledge that's being shared that's like Allah is so merciful, Allah is forgiving, like it's but it keeps it's so overly merciful that it doesn't it doesn't mean I don't have to do anything. It doesn't call me to accountability. Right? It's so gentle in, in to the sense that again, it doesn't move my body to more ibadah. It doesn't say no, I need to repent. It doesn't say oh no, I need to check myself. Oh no, my ego is out of control. It doesn't call me to account about myself. Does that make sense? And so there should be there should be some some when that learning is happening, there should be something that that definitely points inward to some like you're able to recognize from the reflection of this light, I'm I'm a witness to my own darkness. Right? And because Allah Allah is al muntaqim Allah is Adar. <laughs> Like, that part is not going away, you know? And so, like, Allahu ar-Rahman, but Allah is also the Lord of the hellfire. And so, with it should have that balance, right, of hoping that I should be between, you know, hope and love and fear. Right? It should have that balance. That's just... Jazakallah khair to Allah both Allah. of you for joining mm-hmm. us this evening. Um, Ustazah, can we ask for a closing du'a to Inshallah. wrap up the night? Ya Rab. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbin Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina wa Habibina wa Munana Muhammad. Wa ala hali Sayyidina wa Munana Muhammad. Ya awalin awalin. Ya akharin akharin. Ya dukuwatin mateen. Ya rahmin masakeen. Ya arhamu rahmin. Ya arhamu rahmin. Ya arhamu rahmin. Ya Allah, we thank you for allowing us to be Muslim. Ya Rabbi, thank you for this blessed month of Ramadan. Ya Rabbi, thank you for this month of the Quran. Thank you for this fast, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you bless us to be able to, to meet our responsibilities. Ya Rabbi, please forgive us for our shortcomings and our mistakes. Make us from amongst those that are steadfast. Ya Allah, we ask that you give us a complete and perfect faith after which there is no disbelief give a certainty in you after which we never doubt give us a relationship with you ya rabbi by which we do not perform hypocrisy in belief or in our actions ya rabbi give us speech and actions that bring us near and close to you ya rabbi we ask you by your mercy ya rabbi envelop us in your care ya rabbi grant us your cradle of comfort ya allah and this dunya and the akhirah ya rabbi we ask you ya an muhaymin that you protect us ya arhamur rahimin from the enemies of us and the enemies of you ya rabbi please Please protect us from the fire, Ya Rahman. Ya Rabbi, please protect us, Ya Rabbi, from the torment of the grave, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, we ask you by your mercy that you come to the rescue of us, Ya Rabbi. Come to the rescue of us, Ya Rabbi, against our ego. Ya Rabbi, come to our rescue, Ya Rabbi, against our nafs, against our weaknesses, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please bless us to be amongst those who are salihin, who are mutaqeen, who are siddiqeen, Ya Rahman Rahimin. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please come to our rescue, Ya Rabbi, against the enemies of our brothers and sisters in Philistine, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please grant us the liberation, Ya Rabbi, of Masjid al-Aqsa and bless us to inherit it, Ya Rabbi, and make us worthy of it. Ya Rabbi, please come to the rescue of our brothers and sisters, the Uyghur Muslims in China. Ya Rabbi, come to the rescue of my brothers and sisters in Yemen. Ya Rabbi, in Syria, in Sudan, in Somalia. Ya Rabbi, come to their rescue, Ya Allah. Come to the rescue of my brothers and sisters in the Congo. Ya Rabbi, wherever there is violence, Ya Rabbi, let us salam come from you. Salam un qawlam mi Rabbi. Rahim. Ya Rabbi, wherever there is a conflict, Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please bless it with Sakina, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, I ask that you please come to our rescue, Ya Rabbi, before our patience runs out. Ya Allah, Ya Latifu, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, wherever they are starving, Ya Rabbi, we beg you to feed them. Ya Rabbi, wherever they're thirsty, Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please give them clean water to drink, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, wherever they are losing their grip, Ya Rabbi, hold on to them, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you, emb- that you embrace them, Ya Rabbi, why? your strength, Ya Rabbi, by your power. Ya Arhamu Rahimin, Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please push our enemies away from us as far as the north is from the south, as far as the highest levels of Jannah are from the hellfire. Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, please keep them away from us. Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, make them a means by which our faith is elevated and never decreased. Ya Rabbi, you promised, Qad aflaha mu'minun. Ya Rabbi, bless us to be from amongst the believers that you grant your manifest victory. Ya Rabbi, bless us to 
be from amongst those who have foes on Adim, Ya Arhamur Rahimin. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please forgive us for our weakness. Ya Rabbi, please pardon us, Ya Rabbi, for our sins and our mistakes and our transgressions. Ya Rabbi, please remove the stain of our sin from upon our hearts. Ya Rabbi, please remove the stain of our sin from upon the hearts and souls of those that we have wronged, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, bless them to forgive us, Ya Allah. If we've harmed them, if we've wronged them, Ya Rabbi, bless us with their forgiveness, Ya Arhamur Rahimin. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please bless us with the ability to let go of our trauma, Ya Rabbi, heal us, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please make us anew, Ya Arhamur Rahimin. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you build us up, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, grant us a light from your light, Ya Anur. Ya Al Hadi, grant us a guidance from your guidance, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, grant us tawfiq wal afia from you, Ya Arhamur Rahimin. Ya Rabbi, grant us a courage and a strength from you, Ya Al Qawiyu, Ya Al Azimu, Ya Azizu, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please gaze upon us with your nadar of rida. Ya Rabbi, gaze upon us with your gaze of pleasure, Ya Allah. Make us to be from amongst those, Ya Rabbi, who receive a full portion of your mercy in dunya wa akhirah. Ya Rabbi, please bless us to be from amongst those that when the angel of death comes to take our soul, Ya Rabbi, let it be gently. Ya Rabbi, when the angel of death comes to take our soul, let our tongue say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rabbi, have mercy on us when they wash our bodies. Ya Rabbi, have mercy on us when they lower us in the grave. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please make us firm upon the questioning. Make us to be from amongst those who say with yaqeen, with a certainty. Ya Rabbi, with absolute hope in your promise to say that you were our Lord, Ya Allah. That Islam was our deen and that the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was our action, Ya Allah, and that the Quran was our book, Ya Rabbi, but beyond our testimony, Ya Rabbi, let our eyes, our ears, our tongues, our feet, Ya Rabbi, let our souls testify that we were truthful in our speech, Ya Rabbi, let our souls, Ya Rabbi, and our bodies testify that we were true to our, that we were true to our shahada, Ya Rahamur Rahimin, Ya Rabbi, bless us to be from amongst those that you save from the torment of the grave and the punishment of the hellfire, Ya Rabbi, on the day of resurrection, let it be from the let the hand of the Prophet وسلم, pull us out of our grave. Ya Rabbi, let it be from his blessed hand that we take a drink from at the home. Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please save us from being accountable. Ya Rabbi, grant us your Jannah Firdaus al ala without reckoning. Ya Rabbi, surely we're not worthy of this, Ya Rabbi, but we beg you by your mercy. Ya Rabbi, by your power and your gentleness, Ya Latifu, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, we ask you by love of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by your love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we ask that you please grant us a complete and perfect pardon, Ya Rabbi, by which you will allow us to enter into Jannah Firdaus al ala with him, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. Ya Rabbi, allow us to enter into Jannah to Firdaus al with him. Ya Rahmu Rahimin. Ya Rabbi, by your mercy and your gentleness, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, wherever our family members are not guided, Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please guide them. Wherever, Ya Rabbi, we have fallen down, Ya Rabbi, we ask that you pick us up. Wherever we are confused, Ya Rabbi, we ask that you please guide us. Ya Rabbi, we, wherever we have fallen short, Ya Al-Jabbar, please complete us. Ya Rabbi, wherever, Ya Rabbi, that we are in a state of fear and anxiety, Ya Rabbi, come to our rescue with a sakila and a salam from you, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, we place all of our affairs in front of you, asking you, please, Ya Allah, rectify all of our affairs in dunya wal akhir. Ya Arhamur Rahimin, Ya Arhamur Rahimin, Ya Arhamur Rahimin. Ya Rabbi, by the power of this month of Ramadan, we ask that you please accept our du'a. Ya Rabbi, by this power of the month of Ramadan, we ask you for everything that the Prophet وسلم, asked you for, Ya Rabbi, that is appropriate for us. Ya Rabbi, we ask you for everything that those who are beloved to you ask you for, Ya Rabbi, that is appropriate for us. And we seek refuge in you, Ya Rabbi, from everything that Nabi Allah Muhammad sought refuge in you from, Ya Allah, that is appropriate for us. And we ask you by your mercy, Ya Arhamur Rahimin, to please accept this dua from us. Bless us, Ya Rabbi, with a full blessing of this Ramadan to meet Laylatul Qadr while you're pleased with us. Ya Allah, Ya Arhamur Rahimin, let us never be outside of your mercy or your gentleness or your protection. Ya Arhamur Rahimin, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina habibina wa munana muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam subhana rabbika rabbin azata amma يصفون والسلام على المرسلين وللحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة